Praise the Lord. We we'll close our eyes as we pray together. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for the Bible study. We bless your name for keeping us alive to see these days and to hear what we hear. We're asking, O oh Lord, that your word will bring light into every heart, every life in Jesus' name. We pray we'll not be like the Pharisees that knew the letters of the word, but they miss the spirit of the word. That will not be like the people that are always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. We pray, Lord, you bring us to the experiential knowledge of what we're studying in Jesus' name. So that the evidence of salvation, redemption, righteousness will be seen visible in every one of our lives in Jesus' name. That we will not be nominal, superficial students of the Bible. Will be people that live out the word you're teaching every one of us. We pray that this word will bear fruit in every life in Jesus' name. Thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. I welcome you to the Bible study tonight in Jesus' name. We're looking at Daniel chapter 12. I'm starting from verse 1. Daniel 12 verse 1 And at that time We learned last week Is the time of the great tribulation The time when the Antichrist will make himself God And then he'll say That he's running Put himself as a central figure To be worshipped In the temple of the living God But it says at that time Shall Michael stand up The great prince Which stands for the children of thy people. He's talking about the angel, archangel. And he calls him the great prince that stands. That he is defending the children of Israel. And defending all the purposes of God, the plans of God. For the children of Israel. And it says at that time. When the terror, the intensity of the great tribulation will be so much upon the children of Israel. That for the children of Israel, he will stand up to defend them. And then it says, and there shall be a time of trouble. Already we have learned from Jeremiah chapter 30 verse 7. That the time of the great tribulation is the time of Jacob's trouble. And also Moses said the same thing. It's a time of trial. A time of temptation. A time of trouble and a time of real terror upon the nation. And then it says in that verse 1, And as it's such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. It's saying us that the time of the great tribulation will be a time of unprecedented suffering, unprecedented pain, real terrible problem, Upon the children of Israel and upon the world. And Jesus said the same thing that that will be a time when the suffering that will appear upon the earth at that time will be as if nothing ever happened before. And he says, At that time, thy people shall be delivered. The word of God tells us that at that time there will be a remnant of the people that will be delivered. We're looking at Zechariah chapter 13. I'm looking at verses 8 and 9. Zechariah chapter 13, verse 8. And it shall come to pass that in all the land, says the Lord, two parts therein shall be cut off and die. But the third shall be left therein. And I will bring the third part through the fire and will refine them as silver is refined. I will try them as gold is tried. They shall call on my name and I will hear them. I will say, it is my people. And they shall say, the Lord is my God. At the time of the great tribulation, two thoughts of them would have perished. Because of the pressure, the persecution, the pain, the problem that the Antichrist will bring upon the Jewish people in particular at that time. But one third will be saved. 
That's why the Bible says that the remnant of the children of Israel eventually will be saved, will be delivered out of that calamity that they'll find themselves. All that one thought remaining at that time will then be delivered. We're looking at Romans chapter 11. In Romans chapter 11, I'm looking at verse 26. In verse 26, so all Israel, that is all the Israel remaining, all the remnant remaining, all Israel shall be saved. As it is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them, when I shall take away their sins. The Lord will take away their sin at that time. That time of the great tribulation when terrible suffering will come upon them. Matthew chapter 24. As Jesus Christ himself spoke about that time of the great tribulation. A time of terrible suffering. A time of terrible pain. A time that never, never appeared among the children of Israel. All they had gone through from the time of Pharaoh. Until the time of Nebuchadnezzar, until the time of Alexander the Great, until the time of Antiochus Epiphany, it's like they have never seen anything because greater suffering will come upon them. Matthew chapter 24, verse 21. For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. Be. See what the Lord Himself said that a time of the great tribulation will be a time of great, terrible suffering, something that never happened in the world before. Verse 22 And except those days shall be shortened, there should no flesh be saved, but for the elect's sake. That's a remnant right there. That's a one thought that Zechariah Zek- Zek- uh, talked about. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. I pray you will not be here at that time in Jesus' name. Because the rapture is going to take place before the time of the great tribulation. And those who are saved and living righteous, holy, sanctified lives, who have gone up in the rapture before the great tribulation will come upon this world. We're looking at Daniel now, chapter 12, verse 2. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting content. And then in verse 3, and they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. Already now we're coming to the last chapter of Daniel. And as you look at Daniel, you see that he was a special prophet in the Old Testament. An extraordinary prophet in the Old Testament. Why do we say that? Because the prophecy of Daniel covers thousands of years. It covers a long period of time, from the time of Nebuchadnezzar until the very end of time. We've been studying from chapter 1. And you have seen how the Lord himself had been revealing, revealing his mind, revealing his will. Revealing his words, revealing his future plan to the children of Israel through Daniel and through Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And we have seen that he started from the time of Nebuchadnezzar when he saw that golden image that was very high and very big. And then he saw it until the stone came and then struck that image. And everything crumbled to the ground. And Daniel explained that those are various kingdoms. Number one, the Babylonian Empire. He prophesied about that. And not only that, he prophesied about the Middle Persian Empire. And then the Grecian Empire. And then until the Roman Empire. And at the end of the Roman Empire, he prophesied about the coming king. The king of kings and the lord of laws. That will break down all the kingdoms of the world. That means then the prophecy of Daniel spanned or covered from the time of Nebuchadnezzar until the time of the second coming of the Lord. As you look at his prophecy then covering and concerning Nebuchadnezzar, Belshazzar, Alexander the Great, Antiochus Epiphany, and Christ's first advent, that is when Christ came the first time, and Christ's sacrificial death, he spoke about that too, and the Roman Empire, and then the great tribulation now that I have spoken about, and he's spoken about the restoration 
of Israel's remnant and the resurrection of the dead and the reign of Christ on earth. And he also spoke about the time of the and Christ's everlasting dominion. You then understand that Daniel was not an ordinary prophet. He was this extraordinary prophet with extraordinary vision, extraordinary understanding, extraordinary life that he lived. And God gave him the favor and the privilege to be able to see all those things, considering then the span and the details and the depth. The length and the breadth, the significance and the scope of the prophecy of Daniel, we can say that Daniel was one of the greatest prophets in the Old Testament. A faithful man, an uncompromising man, a righteous man, a man of power, a man of pungency, a man of purity, a man that stood for the truth faithfully all through his life without any day or any time or any period of backsliding. Now, the verses we're looking at today, that is the verses under consideration in this study. They deal with the resurrection of the dead. And here Daniel reveals the resurrection of the just and the resurrection of the unjust. That is the resurrection of all the dead who ever lived on earth, Jews and Gentiles, in all generations from the time of Adam till the very last man at the end of the world. It's telling us that just as all seas, whether they're good or bad, as sown, sown in the earth, are quickened made alive, and the germinate, so all men, good and bad, just and unjust, will be raised from the dead eventually, and the righteous will be raised to everlasting life, while the righteous will be raised to shame and everlasting content. That's what we're looking at today. We're looking at the study under this title, The Resurrection and the Rewards of the Righteous and the Unrighteous. We're dividing the message to three parts. Number one, the resurrection of the righteous. The people that know the Lord. The people who are saved. The people whose names are written in the book of life. Their sins had been forgiven. They received the grace of God by faith. And by faith, they lived a life that was gracious, that was good, that was righteous, that was upright. And those people, on the final day, if they have lived a righteous life, it says, there is the resurrection of the righteous. On the other hand, there are the people that were wicked, the people that were righteous, the people that were sinful, the people that were hiding in their sins, the people that refused to repent or to turn after they heard the word of God, or the people that didn't even care enough to hear the word of God at all. It says there'll be a resurrection too, and it's the resurrection of the unrighteous. Point number two, the resurrection of the unrighteous. And then point number three, the rewards of the righteous. I pray you'll be among the righteous in Jesus' name. But you know, for you to be among the righteous, that means you would have recognized why sinner. I recognize all of sin and come short of the glory of God. And that you couldn't save yourself. And the greatest gift you could have, the greatest experience you could have, and the greatest profession you could have is the salvation of your soul. That you come to the Lord Jesus Christ, turn away from your sin, and then you allow the blood of Jesus Christ to wash you and to cleanse you. And then the Spirit of God bearing witness with your heart. You are now a child of God. And from that point on, as the Spirit of God dwells within you, He helps you, directs you, leads you to live a life that is pleasing unto the Lord. Every day, every moment of your life, you're asking yourself, does this please the Lord? Is it all right before the Lord? Is the grace of God walking this out of me? And you subdue the flesh, and you subdue self, and then you say, Lord, I want to live to the glory of your name. As we keep right just like that, by the grace of God, on the final day, if you die before the time of the rapture, on the final day, you rise to life and rewards in Jesus' name. But for the people that reject the gospel, for the people that hear the gospel, but they turn their ears to the gospel and they say, no, they don't want to live righteous life. They don't want to care about living a holy life, a saintly life, a sanctified life. On that final day, they should they will rise. It will be right. It will be rising unto condemnation. The resurrection of the unjust. Let's come to point number one: the resurrection of the righteous. The resurrection of the righteous, and see how the Bible talks about it. Resurrection. Christ talked about it too. 
And the apostles talk about it. And we know that this is real. This is true. And Daniel had no doubt. He said that on that final day, the righteous will rise. Let's come to Daniel chapter 12. And I'm reading from verse 2. Daniel chapter 12. We're looking at verse 2. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth. Obviously, you understand? He's talking about death. It's not just talking about the people that sleep. We don't sleep inside the dust of the earth when we sleep at night. It's talking about the people that die. And their bodies are buried. And their bodies are buried inside the earth. They sleep in the dust of the earth. It says many of them shall awake. Some to everlasting life. Those are the righteous people. Some to everlasting life. Was the resurrection a new doctrine, a new understanding, a new experience that the Lord was talking about only through Daniel? Or were there people before Daniel that understood there's going to be the resurrection of the dead? Let's look at Job many, many years before Daniel was ever born. Job spoke about it. He spoke about the resurrection. In Job chapter 19 verse 25. Yeah, it says, fine, no. He said, I'm not guessing this one. I'm not feeling this. I'm not trying to make this one. Uh, making sure that, you know, do I know that? Am I sure of this? Am I doubting? He said, I know of a certainty. For I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. And you see here, Job also got revelation. Revelation about the coming Christ. About the Savior. About the Lord, about this one that will come to take away our sins. And then not only that he'll come the first time, he'll come the second time as time at the latter day. And then in verse 26, and though after my skin worms destroy this body, isn't that death? Of course. When it says the skin worms, they destroy my body, and then I'm dead. Then it says, Yet in my flesh shall I see. God is talking about the resurrection right there. That means then Bible believers from days of old, they believed the resurrection. And Daniel now was getting the revelation that the resurrection was going to take place. Look at verse 27. Whom I shall see for myself and mine eyes shall behold and not another though my rays be consumed within me. Saying after death there is resurrection. What did Isaiah say about the resurrection? Look at Isaiah. Again, Isaiah was a prophet that lived before the time of Daniel. That means then the resurrection was not a new doctrine when Daniel just rose up. But God just revealed to him. He revealed another aspect of that resurrection unto Daniel. And what we're studying today is not, it's not coming to you for the first time. Others have heard about it. Others have learned it. And we're learning it to you. And it profited them when they learned it. And I pray it will profit you, profit me, profit us together in Jesus' name. Isaiah 26, I'm reading from verse 19. Thy dead men shall live. That's very clear. That's resurrection. They are dead, but they shall live in the future. The time is coming when they will hear the voice of power, the voice of thunder, thundering unto them in the grave. And then at that time, the power of the Almighty God, the creative power of God that created the universe and created us in the original, at the original time, that same voice with creative power will wake up the whole day. Thy dead men shall live together with my dead body shall they arise. Those two words, when you combine them, the dead bodies will live, the dead bodies will arise. That's resurrection. The prophet saw it. The prophets prophesied about it. And the prophets proclaimed and declared it. There's going to be the resurrection of the dead. Awake and sing ye that dwell in the dust. That's resurrection. It says the people that dwell in the dust, that sleep in the dust, that lie in the dust. The people that are dead and buried, that they're going to arise. It says arise from the dust. Awake and sing. For the dew is as the dew of the herbs, and the earth shall cast out the dead. That's it. 
is in that single verse alone. See how many times the resurrection is mentioned. Thy dead men shall live as a resurrection. Together with my dead body shall they arise. Second time, that's the resurrection. Awake and sing each thee that dwell in the earth. That's the third time, that's the resurrection. For the dew is as the dew of the earth, and the earth shall cast out the dead. That's the resurrection right there. Four times in one single verse. Resurrection, 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 resurrection. Which gives us then the assurance that there's going to be the resurrection of the dead. That's why it now says in verse 20, Come, my people, enter thou into thy chambers and shut thy doors about thee. Hide thyself as it were for a little moment until the indignation be overpassed. It's saying that the people of God should shut the door and then pray to the Lord and then hide themselves in the pavilion of the Lord. Hide themselves in the hiding place, in the secret place of the most high so that the protection of the Lord, the grace of the Lord will cover them and they will not go through all the trials and the trouble and the tribulation that the people of the world, the sinners are going to go through when you shut yourself with the Lord and the presence of the Lord and the protection of the Lord and the power of the Lord is keeping you and then you say for behold the Lord cometh out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity the earth also shall disclose her blood and shall no more cover her slain. Well, it is very clear then that the Bible talks very clearly about the resurrection. Of course, you know that when Jesus Christ came, he spoke very clearly, very definitely about the resurrection. And we learn from the words of Jesus Christ that the dead shall rise again. As we look at Matthew chapter 22 verse 29. Matthew chapter 22, verse 29. There were people at that time that will argue. The people that will disbelieve. The people that will say, how can that be? And the Lord said, they didn't understand. Because they didn't know the scriptures, neither did they know the power of God. Matthew chapter 22, I'm reading from verse 29. Jesus answered and said unto them, Ye do err, you go astray, not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God. You see those two things there? And it, it's concerning the resurrection here. As Jesus Christ was talking to these Sadducees, he said, you, you err, you make a mistake, you go astray, you have wrong doctrine, you have wrong perspective. And the reason for having the wrong perspective is, number one, not knowing the scriptures. Number two, not the power of God. And in any way you find anybody, not only on the resurrection, on salvation, for example, that we can be saved, we can live a righteous life, we can live a holy life, and that whosoever is born of God does not commit sin. There are people who don't believe that. You know the, you know the reason why? Not knowing the scriptures, not knowing the power of God. And the Bible talks about sanctification. That we can be sanctified and the old nature totally removed and we become new creatures totally within and without. And we live the pure life, the righteous life, the innocent life, and the transparent life. And some people doubt that. Do you know why they doubt it? Not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God. And some people, when they hear about the baptism of the Holy Ghost, they say, How can that be that the power of God will come upon you? And then you speak in another language you never learned. They say, How can that be? Do you know why they doubt? They doubt because they do not know the scriptures. They do not know the power of God. Or sometimes, we're talking about miracles, signs, and wonders, and healing. Other people say, how can that be? How can God heal the sick today? And they feel that the age of miracle is past. You know why? Not knowing the scriptures and not knowing the power of God. Whenever you find anybody doubting anything, that the word of God clearly stays, and they put their mind and their brain, and they put their own opinion about the word of God, the problem is revealed right there. Not knowing the scriptures on the one hand, and not knowing the scripture, not knowing the power of God on the other, and come back to resurrection in verse 30, for in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but as the angels of God in heaven. That is the righteous people when we rise up eventually from the dead. It says, we'll be like the angels. We'll not die anymore. We'll be able to move with the, with the speed of the angels. We'll know they will know how the angels know. And everything that the angels have as attributes and characteristics we will have. Because now we carry on or we carry around resurrection body. Verse 31. 
but as as touching the resurrection of the dead, have ye not read that that which was spoken unto you by God, saying, I am the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. God is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. That Jesus Christ was proving to them that when it says the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob is implying that they are not dead, they are going to rise so again because God is not the God of the dead, is the God of the living. The resurrection of the righteous, the rising of the righteous from the dead is real. And I pray that God will make you a partaker of it in Jesus' name. In Luke chapter 20, I'm reading from verse 27. Luke chapter 20, we're looking at it from verse 27. 20, 27. Then came to him certain of the Sadducees. These were the people, unbelievers, doubters, the people that uh, kind of made their mind to go against the word of God. And they exalted their opinion, erroneous opinion, above the reaching revealed word of God, which deny that there is any resurrection. And they asked him, saying, Master, Moses wrote unto us, If any man's brother die, having a wife, and he die without children, that his brother shall take his wife and raise up siege unto his brother. There were therefore seven brethren, and the first took a wife, and died without children. And the second took her to wife, and he died childless. And the third took her, and in, the, in like manner the seven also, and they left no children, and died. Last of all, the woman died also. You see, they are trying to use their own kind of uh, worldly logic, their own kind of carnal logic. And that's what some people do. They, they use their, pe their, their, their peanut brain, their little brain, and they set that against the word of God. And they say, but look at this, and look at this, and look at this. If this, this, and this are so, how can there be the resurrection? That's what they were thinking, that those seven men, they were, they were husbands to this one woman. And eventually, the woman died. And now, if you are talking about the resurrection, and they wanted to know, who will be the husband of that woman after the resurrection? That's when Jesus Christ now began to answer them. Look at verse 34. And Jesus answering said unto them, The children of this world marry and are given in marriage, but they which shall be, which shall be accounted worthy to obtain that world and the resurrection from the dead, neither marry nor are given in marriage, neither can they die anymore. Do you see that? That after the resurrection there's no more death. And then it says uh, they'll not be having natural bodies that will be producing children. They don't die anymore. They don't get married after the resurrection for they are equal unto the angels and are the children of God being children of the resurrection. Well, the point is that the righteous are going to rise. There's going to be the resurrection. And the prayer is you'll be among them. John chapter 5 John chapter 5 We're looking at you from verse 25 John chapter 5 verse 25 Very late, very late, I say unto you Whenever Jesus said anything like that He was saying something irrevocable Something irreversible Something you cannot argue against He said very late, surely Surely, I say unto you As surely without any shadow of doubt This is going to happen I'm telling you, that's what Jesus said. The hour is coming. And now is when, when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God. And they that hear shall live. For as the Father has life in himself, so has he given to the Son to have life in himself. And has given him authority to execute judgment also. Because he is the Son of Man. Marvel not at this. Don't be surprised at this. Don't be like the Sadducees that wander and perish. Don't be like the Pharisees that wander and perish. Don't be like the people that hear the word of God and they are amazed, they are astonished, and they marvel. Because this, how can that be? Come with your faith and understand that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Son of Man, Lord of Lords and King of Kings, He knows more than you know. And He knows more than all the people of the world know. And He's talking from that heavenly knowledge understanding of that heavenly revelation that's why it said marvel not at this for the hour is coming in the which all
all that are in the grave shall hear the, his voice and they shall come forth. That's the resurrection. They that have done good unto the resurrection of life. They that have done good. How do you do good? By becoming good. How do you become good? By becoming a child of God. How do you become a child of God? As many as received him. To them he gave power. To become the sons of God. Even to them that believe on his name. Because it's when you believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord changes your bad nature. Your sinful nature. Your evil character. And it changes you to be good. Otherwise they say without me you can do nothing. Without being saved. Without giving your life to the Lord. If you are just a natural man. Just a nominal Christian. Just a church goer. Just a Bible reader. Just a superficial religious man. Religious woman. If you are just superficial. You will not be able to do good. But when Jesus Christ the good one. The gracious one. The great one. When he enters into your heart. And he lives a new life through you. That's how you become good. And he says when you have Jesus Christ like that. And through his grace. And through his power, and through his enablement, through his life within you, you do good and you say, you come to the resurrection of life. And they that have done evil, who are those people, unsaved people, unrighteous people, they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. I pray yours will not be a resurrection of damnation. It will be a resurrection of life in Jesus' name. Acts of the Apostles, I'm reading to you from chapter 24. Acts chapter 24. Old Testament affirms it. The New Testament affirms it. Christ Jesus affirmed it. And the Apostles too, they affirmed it. There's going to be the resurrection of the righteous. In Acts of the Apostles chapter 24 verse 15. And I've hoped toward God, which they themselves also allow, that there shall be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and unjust, both of the believers and the unbelievers, both of the saved and the unsaved, both of the sanctified and the unsanctified, both of the disciples of the Lord and the disciples of Satan. Everyone will assume that resurrection. But after that resurrection, we go to different places. I pray you'll go to the right place. In First Corinthians chapter 15. First Corinthians chapter 15. And we're reading there from verse 20 to verse 22. But now is Christ risen from the dead. And become the first fruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man that is Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Son of Man, came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all died, so even so in Christ shall all be made alive. And now in verse 51, verse 51, behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. That's the resurrection right there, as well as the rapture. We shall not all sleep, we shall not all die. We shall all be changed. Then it says in verse 52, in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the, for the trumpet shall sound, and uh, what's the next thing? The dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. You see the resurrection there. The dead shall be changed, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible. And it says, For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the same that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. It says, because of the resurrection. And because when the resurrection takes place, we're going to be rewarded for the good things we have done. And we're going to reckon, we're going to be called into account for the bad things that have been done. It says, because of that, therefore, in verse 58, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord, the Lord will reward us. I said the Lord will reward us. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, talking about the resurrection and the catching away of the saints. 
1 Thessalonians chapter 4 verse 16 Here it says For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven With a shout And with the voice of the archangel Or the trump of God And the dead in Christ shall rise first It's very clear then all over the scriptures That there is the resurrection That's why Daniel said Many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake That means they'll be raised from the dead The prophets did not stagger At the revelation of God They didn't say how can that be They knew with God all things are possible And when God says that the dead Are going to rise and it's going to make Those who have died for many years Even those who are drowned in the sea Or those who are burnt to ashes Or those who are just, just, just lost And nobody can see their body The Lord is going to get all the Ashes and all the dust and all the molecules of their body is going to get everything together and at the final day they'll appear before the Lord you see the prophets of old they did not limit God's revelation by their understanding or lack of understanding the resurrection of the dead is revealed in scripture as we are brought together from the Old Testament to the New Testament the prophets, the apostles and Christ himself our Lord and Savior all revealed the truth of the resurrection the dead body will be raised. They will be quickened to come alive. Our Lord and his apostles taught the doctrine of the resurrection of the just and the resurrection of the just as well. And now Daniel is telling us that the righteous shall awake, awake to everlasting life. The just, that is the justified, the forgiven, the redeemed, the pardoned, and those who have been made righteous by the cleansing of the blood of the Lamb. It says that these righteous ones, they will come forth out of their graves and they will come to the resurrection of life because they believed in Christ because they received the grace of God and because they lived righteously by faith walking in the spirit and not in the flesh they shall not come into condemnation the saints resurrection will be a glorious resurrection I'll be part of that we shall share in the glory of the risen, reigning Christ. I pray when that time comes, you'll be there in Jesus' name. But Daniel did not only talk about the resurrection of the righteous. He also spoke about the resurrection of the unrighteous. Come back to Daniel chapter 12. In Daniel chapter 12, he tells us, I'm going to read verse 2 again. Daniel chapter 12 verse 2. And many of them that sleep in the dust of their shall awake, some to everlasting life. Those are the righteous people, safe people, redeemed people. And those are the people that lived according to the commandments of the word of the Lord. They live day by day by that will of God in little things as well as in big things. They didn't allow the flesh to control them. They didn't allow Satan to control them. They didn't allow the sins all around them to have so much pressure on them to make them go astray. They lived in righteousness and it says if they die before the rapture, that on that final day of resurrection, they will rise up and they will rise to life everlasting but now he talks on the second part and some to shame and everlasting content he said there are some that are going to rise up to you they are unjust they are righteous they are sinful they are carnal they are wicked they are evil they are unrepentant they are hiding their sin they too they will die because appointed unto men wants to die. And after this, the judgment. And when that judgment comes, after that resurrection, when the sinners rise up, and then they appear before the great white throne judgment, they'll be condemned unto shame and everlasting reproach and contempt. Let's look at the word of God. Look at Hebrews chapter 9 verse 27. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 27 telling us this is the reality of the matter. And it's just a few years to come that this will happen. In Hebrews chapter 9 verse 27 as it is appointed unto men once to die. And then it says but after this the judgment. Do you see resurrection there? You, sure? you see resurrection there? They, they die. If there's no life after death if they are just dead and totally forgotten, if they are dead and buried, how do, you, how do you punish a dead body? How do you judge a dead body? It means there's resurrection. It says it's appointed unto men wants to die. And after that day, there's resurrection. And it is those who are risen, 
those who are raised from the dead, they will now be called into question because of the evil things that they have done. After this, the judgment. We're looking at Psalm 9, verses 16 and 17. There's judgment after this. Psalm 9, we're looking at verses 16 and 17. The Lord is known by the judgment which he executed. He's keeping everything in record. That's why he is the Lord. Nothing escapes his view. Nothing escapes his reckoning. The eyes of the Lord are running to and fro. He sees our motive. He sees our manners. He sees our character. He sees what we do. And he sees why we do them. And he sees how we do them. Not just what you do. There's always a purpose behind every action. There is a reason behind every action. There's a motive behind every action. And God sees all that. That's why he's God. Man may not see. Man may not know. There is sin for doing what you do. The why. The how. The way. The where. But God sees everything. That's why it says the Lord is known by the judgment which he executed. The wicked is sneered and in the work of his own hand. In verse 17, the wicked shall be turned into where? Those who are not saved. Those who are not born again. Those who pretend to be saved. And God knows that everything they do, even when they appear to do what, what, what is seemingly good, the motive is wrong, the why, the how is wrong. And the Lord is saying that all the wicked that do those wicked things, those evil things, they do it in the secret, they do it in the public, they do it when people are not there, they do it when people are there, and they live in those sins that they cover up. And you know what they do? And you, you see them, you meet them, and sometimes they cannot even totally hide it. And sometimes, maybe you yourself, you've copied them and say, church members are not here, nobody will know this, and God knows everything. And he says, the wicked shall be turned into hell, and all the nations that forget God. I pray everyone will repent. You know, when we come to the Bible study like this, and we're hearing the word of God over and over, week after week, if there's no repentance, what a terrible judgment will come upon us then, because we cannot claim that we're ignorant, because we know and yet, the Lord sees that we deliberately reject the word. I pray you will not reject the word. Let's look at Jeremiah chapter 23 verse 40. Jeremiah chapter 23 verse 40. We're talking about the resurrection of the unrighteous. The resurrection of the unjust. The resurrection of the sinners. The resurrection of the wicked. And when those wicked people, when they rise up eventually, they come into judgment. We're looking at Jeremiah chapter 23 verse 40. And I will bring an everlasting reproach upon you and a perpetual shame which shall not be forgotten. Those are the unrighteous people. Those are the sinners. Those are the people that are hiding in sin. They will not repent. Jeremiah spoke to them. Jeremiah told them over and over and over. In fact, he lamented, said, and mend your ways. Turn around and make you a new heart and turn to the Lord and do the will of the Lord. Ask for the old way. And where is the old path, the good way? And walk therein. And the people adamantly said, no, we will not walk therein. So the Lord said, go and tell them, Jeremiah, resurrection will happen. And their shame will be unforgettable. It will be everlasting. I will bring an everlasting reproach upon you. And a perpetual shame which shall not be forgotten. And then we're looking at Luke chapter 13. Where the Lord Jesus Christ himself said, Yes, there is going to be a resurrection. And in that future life, the people, the Jewish people in particular, now he was talking to, that they knew the truth, but they will not follow the truth. He said, when that resurrection comes on, they will see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and the prophets. They will see them in the very presence of God, but they themselves will be turned away, turned away, turned away. What sorrow and what terrible sin, judgment will come upon them in that day. I pray that will not be your Lord. If that is not going to be your Lord, you must repent. You must allow the word of God you are hearing to be a fruit in your life and turn you around and turn you to the Lord and make you to live righteously and godly in a pure life, even in this world where you have the chance to live according to the will of God. Luke chapter 13, I'm reading from verse 23. Luke chapter 13, verse 23. And then said one unto him, Lord, are there few that be saved? And he said unto them, 
strive to enter in at the gate. Strive to enter in at the gate. You know what that means? Endeavor to do it. Determine to do it. Be diligent in doing it. Make all the effort in entering in at the gate. As you look at yourself, would you say you are diligent? Would you say you are determined? Would you say you are making the effort? Would you say you are doing your very best to enter in? As you come to the Bible study, the way you hear the Bible study, and the way you pay attention to everything that is said, and the way you take notes, and the way you say, Lord, I match this with my life, and the way you say, Lord, I need to straighten this out, and the way you pray after the Bible study, would you say you are diligent? Would you say you are striving to enter? The Lord Jesus Christ said, strive to enter in. At the gate, for many I say unto you, will seek to enter in and shall not be able. They'll come when it is too late. They'll cry when it is too late. They'll plead when it's too late. They'll try to repent when it's too late. Now at this time of opportunity, this is the time to strive and this is the time to determine and this is the time to make all the effort that you'll enter in, that you don't make the Bible study a playground. You don't make the Bible study child's play. You don't make the Bible study just that usual religion, usual day to day and week to week attendance. But you say, I'm coming in and the way of the kingdom is being revealed unto me and I want to be righteous, I want to be pure, I want to be sanctified, I want to be holy and I want to live a land that is pleasing unto the Lord so that when that day of resurrection will come I'll be among the people, the judge that will be resurrected and risen to the resurrection of life. In verse 25, when once the master of the house is risen up and has shut the door and ye begin to stand without and to knock at the door saying Lord, Lord, open unto us and he shall answer and say unto you, I know you not whence ye are. What a voice they will hear on that day. When they will say, open unto us. By the way, that's resurrection. That's resurrection because now you know what he's saying. They were dead already. And after death, they did not want, they did not come alive. And they're able to speak. And they're able to knock. And they're able to say, Lord, Lord, open unto us. And the Lord will say, I never knew you. And then they will say, then shall ye begin to say, we have eaten and drunk in thy presence, and thou hast taught in our streets. And he shall say, I tell you, I know, I know you not when she are. Depart from me, all ye that walk, what? Tell me out loud. Walk in equity. What do you walk? Do you walk righteousness or iniquity? What influence do you have on your friends, on your neighbors, on your brothers and sisters, on your junior ones and the senior ones at home? Would you say it's righteousness? Do people look at your life and they say, because of the righteousness in his life, I want to be righteous. I'm thirsty for righteousness. Because of what I see, the quietness in his life and the faithfulness in his life and the holiness in his life makes me thirsty, makes me desirous to live a holy life, a righteous life. Or do people see you and then you are an encouragement to iniquity. You bend them towards iniquity. You bend them away from the word of God. You harden their hearts in iniquity. If they say, if so and so, they call you brother, but I don't know whether heaven calls you brother. If they call you sister, I don't know why heaven calls you sister. If brother so and so can do that, that means maybe it's not wrong. If sister so and so can do that, maybe I can do that too. And you lead them and influence them to walk sin and iniquity. And the Lord will say on that day, that day of the resurrection, of the unjust, I never knew you depart from me. Ye that work iniquity, and there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. There will be no jesting at that time. There will be no smiling at that time. There will be no making jest or ridiculing righteousness or ridiculing the preaching of the word at that time. It will be a terrible time. A time of shame and everlasting contempt. And then it says, there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. When ye shall see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Wait a minute. You shall see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Before Jesus Christ came into the world, Abraham was dead. He'll rise again. Isaac was dead. He'll rise again. Jacob was dead. He'll rise again. This is resurrection. The Lord is showing us and teaching us in all ways by the illustrations, by the examples, by the statements, by the declaration, and by the proclamation. There is the resurrection of the righteous and the resurrection of the unjust, of the unrighteous. Ye shall see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God and you yourselves thrust out. 
and there shall come from the east and from the west and from the north and from the south. Look at that. North, west, east, south, from all the corners of the world, from everywhere. And then it says that, and shall sit down in the kingdom of God and behold the, there are last that shall be false and the false that shall be last. I pray on that day you will not regret that you didn't give your life to Jesus Christ. That you didn't live a righteous life. That you didn't live as God wanted you to live. I pray that on that day when the prophets of old and when Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, when Samuel and all those prophets that lived a righteous life when they come before the throne and then God had given you a chance to read about their writing, about the revelation I pray that you will not regret on that day had I known I would have given my life to the Lord, had I known I would have lived a righteous life because at that time there will be a nation of cheese and weeping for the people that remain unrighteous until the last day of of their lives. We're looking at Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 5. Romans chapter 2 verse 5 tells us about the judgment that to come upon those unrighteous people that day of resurrection, but after the, their hardness and the impenitence of, impenitent heart treasures up unto thyself, wrath against the day of wrath. That is, the people that are deliberate sinners, the people that premeditate sin, the people that plan it ahead of time, we're going to do it this way, do it this way. And they're planning sin, sinful things. And it says, after the hardness of their heart and the impenitence, the unrepentant attitude of their heart, the treasure up unto themselves wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who shall render to every man according to his deeds to them who by patient, continuance, and well-doing, seek for glory and honor and immortality there will be eternal life. But unto them that are contentious, unto them that do not obey the truth, but to be unrighteousness, indignation, and wrath. There will be tribulation, verse 9, and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil of the Jew force and also of the Gentile. The Lord is telling us that it's not only the Jews that will experience the resurrection, also the Gentiles will experience the resurrection. And as they experience the resurrection in their sin, in their sinful state, then they will come into tribulation, they will come into anguish, and they will come into judgment, and they will come into the wrath of God. They will come into uh, the punishment that will come upon the evil people on that final day. How important it is to repent, how important it is to call upon the Lord, how important it is to have a change of life, a change of heart, a change of character, and to live a life that the Lord will be able to say, that's my beloved son, that's my beloved daughter, in whom I am well pleased when the Lord sees what you do in the city secret and what you do in the public and he says that's right that's right that's the manifestation of the grace of god in your life it will be unfortunate if the lord will say that's the manifestation of the character of the devil of the character of carnal people sinful people worldly people hardened people and those people on that final day of resurrection they will cry nobody will be there to wipe away their tears i pray that will not happen to you in second thessalonians chapter one second thessalonians chapter one I'm reading there from verse 8 In flaming fire Taking vengeance on them That know not God In flaming fire That is the judgment that will come upon them The punishment that will come upon them Those deliberate sinners Those people that live in presumptuous sin Premeditated sin And those people that had in themselves In doing evil It says in flaming fire Taking vengeance on them That know not God and that, and that will be not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction. You know what Daniel said? Everlasting shame, eternal contempt upon their lives. And you know how Jeremiah put it? It says, a kind of reproach that will never be forgotten. And then here it is saying that it is punishment of everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Let's come to Matthew and see the words of Jesus Christ as he describes the judgment, the punishment that comes upon the people that live on repentant lives all through their lives. Maybe they are religious, but they are not righteous. 
Always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. And never demonstrating obedience to the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, this is a shame. The content everlasting forever that will come upon their lives. And that's the reason why as we come to the Bible study, I hope you are not just saying I'm coming to your Bibles. I'm always there. Always there. Let it have impact in your life. A transforming impact in your life. Let it be a change agent in your life. That your life is no more the same as it used to be. That you are living upright, standing upright, talking upright, and behaving upright. Behaving as a people that are living with eternity in view. And you understand but that Jesus is coming again. And because Jesus is coming again, you are living with that eternal recompense, eternal reward in view. And because you live with eternity in view. You say, how will this match the judgment day? How will they set me free on the judgment day? And you're living with that in mind. Because of that, you'll escape the judgment of God. But the people that just live for today, and they just say, I'll do whatever I want to do. They have no reference point to eternity. All those people are going to be in everlasting shame, everlasting contempt, everlasting punishment on that final day. I pray you'll not be among the foolish people me a good good amen. amen in Matthew chapter 25 I'm reading from verse 31 verse 32 when the son of man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory and before him shall be gathered all nations and shall separate them as one from one another as, as a shepherd divideth a sheep from the goats, a sheep from the goats. It also say his goats. The goats have no master. The goats own no lord. The goats do not submit or surrender to anyone. They are just the goats. But the sheep that are submissive, the sheep that have been changed, the sheep that have been transformed, they belong to the Lord, and it will separate a sheep from the goats. Let's look at verse forty-one. In verse forty-one, then shall. He say unto them on the left hand, depart from me, ye cursed, into it what? Tell me out loud. Everlasting fire. Those are the words of Jesus. Those are the words of Jesus. Remember once again, there are people, they doubt that. There are people that say, no, how can that be? How can that be? You know why? Because they know neither the scriptures nor the power of God. It's always like that. The people that will see the word of God and even the words of Jesus Christ, the very words that he spoke, and they will still doubt it and they will just shrug it off or just wipe it off and just, you know, wave it off and say, I don't believe that. Those are the people they know neither the scriptures nor the power of God. And the Bible says, withdraw from them. Don't be in their camp. The Lord Jesus Christ said, Then shall he say unto them on the left hand side, Depart from me, ye cursed into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Verse 46, and these shall go into everlasting punishment. The punishment of those evil people will be everlasting. Let's look at Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20. The resurrection of the dead is not only for the righteous, it is also for the unrighteous. That is, the righteous will also be raised from the dead to receive their final sentence at the great white throne judgment. Sinners who remain unrepentant, sinners who remain unbelieving until death shall awake to shame and everlasting contempt. And then it says, the scriptures confirm the fact that there shall be a resurrection of the unjust. Our Lord Jesus Christ revealed very clearly, unmistakably, all that are in the grave shall hear, shall come forth. They that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. When a sinner dies, his soul immediately goes into hell fire. In hell, is conscious. You remember the story that Jesus told of Lazarus and the rich man. That rich man went to hell fire. He was conscious there. His soul was not asleep. He is, he is not at rest. You can see that is the sinner who go to hell just as soul and their spirit. Those sinners can see. 
They can feel, they can think, they can remember, they can hear. And that sinner suffers pain and seeks relief, which he will never get, which he will never find. But at the time of the resurrection of the dead, his body is raised from the dead. Life and immortality will be experienced by the body. His soul, spirit, and body will then reunite to live forever, living forever separated from God under condemnation. And the suffering of the sinner, risen, now resurrected, that sinner will now suffer and the punishment will be endless. Look at Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20, I'm reading from verse 11. It says, And I saw a great white throne. And him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand. Can you see that? I saw the dead, small and great, stand. That's resurrection. How do you see the dead standing? Because life came back to them. Because they rose from the dead. I saw the dead small and great. You know, there are some people they say, well, she's still a small girl. Leave her alone. No, she needs to get saved. Because I saw the dead small and great. He's still a little boy. And little boys, they will steal. Why are you worried about that? Little boys, they will do wicked things. Why are you worried about that? When little boys, when you are young, were you not also in those little, little things who are doing a familiar spirit and witchcraft and this? It's just a little boy. Leave him alone. When he grows up, he will grow out of that. What if he dies young? What if he dies small, as a small boy, a small girl? And here the Bible says, I saw the dead, small and great stand before God. And the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in each. That's the resurrection. That's the resurrection. The sea. The people that were drowned in the sea. The sea cast them forth, gave them up. And it says, And death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. That is, the souls in hell will be released. And the bodies under the ground will be released to be reunited together, body, soul, and spirit, to become the whole man and to stand before the judgment seat of God. And they were judged every man. Do you have, are you ever conscious of that? Are you ever conscious of that? They were judged every man. Do you live in the light of eternity? In the light of the resurrection day, they were judged every man. The things you do, the things you say, the small things and the big things, the slander, the lies, the hypocrisy, the wickedness, the sinful things that show the life of the sinner or the life of the backslider. Do you ever think about that? Or do you just say, once they don't know it, once they don't see it, and once the church will not discipline me, and once the leadership will not correct me, and once they will not remove me away from my duty post, what if they don't see you? The Almighty God sees you, and He knows the why, the how, the reason why you do what you do, and because of that, judgment day will come. And when the judgment day comes, it's not going to overlook anything. If you have not repented, it's only when you come to the Lord and say, Lord, I'm sorry for that. I repent. I want to live a righteous life. I want to live my life in the light of eternity. And everything I do, I want to be conscious that there's going to be a judgment day. And you live with that consciousness. It is then by the grace of God. It is then by the protection of the blood of the Lamb. It is then by the mercy of God, the love of God, that overlooks everything you have done after you repented. It's only then forgiveness will come, righteousness will come, and then you'll escape the judgment in Jesus' name. And it says in that verse, and I'm reading that verse 13 again, and to see, give up the dead, which one in each? And death and hell delivered up the dead, which were in them. And they were judged, every man. How many people? Tell me out loud. Tell me out loud. Every man. You know, there are people today that stand behind, especially in the world. They stand behind their godfather, their godmother. They stand behind some authorities. And they say, touch me if you can. 
Rebuke me if you can. Punish me if you can. Because if you taught me, my Godfather will take it up with you. Well, there's no Godfather that can take it up with the Almighty God. He will judge every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever, whosoever, there's no discrimination. Whosoever, there's no partiality. Whosoever, there's no respect of persons. Whosoever was not found reaching in the book of life life was cast where into the lake of fire this is why we preach brothers and sisters this is why we preach pastors and leaders this is why we preach and this is why we're faithful in preaching this is why we don't cover our mouth to say what we need to say this is why we tell the truth as it is and this is why we warn every sinner every backslider look at second corinthians chapter five second corinthians chapter five I'm reading from verse 10, verse 11. This is the reason we're making the noise. We're shouting it. And we're blowing it like a trumpet. That the sinner should repent. The backslider should come back to the Lord. And that you should look at your life as an individual. And just not, don't just follow the crowd. And this is where we're saying. This is the day of repentance and the day of salvation. And this is the time to prepare to live a life. That will be commendable before the almighty God in eternity. We're looking at Second Corinthians chapter 5. And we're looking at verse 10 For we must all appear How many of us? All We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ That everyone may receive the things done in his body According to that he has done Whether it be good or bad Knowing therefore the terror of, of the Lord Knowing therefore the judgment of the Lord Knowing therefore that the righteous will rise Unto the, unto the resurrection of damnation and condemnation Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord We persuade men But we are made Made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your consciences. I pray the Lord will make you wise, make me wise, make all of us wise in Jesus' name. So that every day of our lives, every moment of our lives, we'll live a life that is glorifying to God, that is pleasing to the Lord, and then we'll live with eternity in view. We'll come to point number three, the rewards of the righteous. We're looking at Daniel chapter 12, verse 3. The reward of the righteous. Daniel chapter 12, we're looking at verse 3. And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever give me a good amen yeah. you know there are two kinds of people in the world and these two kinds of people have influence one the righteous people the saved people the sanctified people. One, the people that are following after the Lord and they're interested in the Lord. Their interest every time is how many can I turn to the Lord? How many can I turn away from their sins, away from darkness? How many can I turn unto righteousness? How many can I influence to run after the Lord and follow after the Lord and live in righteousness? That's a, that's a group of people. The other group of people, they're saying, how many people can I make fall? How many people can I turn away from the kingdom? How many people can I turn into darkness? How many people can I corrupt? How many people can I pollute? How many people can I teach to do evil? That those kinds of people are there too. They have a wrong influence. They have a bad influence. They have a corrupting influence. They have a sinful influence. Corrupting impact upon other people. Here we are, our leaders, our coordinators, our group coordinators, our pastors, our regional pastors, our state pastors, our national pastors are doing their best. And they're turning people from sin unto righteousness. And they say, repent. Come to know the Lord. And we're kind of preaching our hearts out. And we're saying, come to know the Lord. And then as we're turning people to the Lord, there are people back there and they're influencing people to go astray, to do evil, and to turn them from the Savior to the Satan, and from light unto darkness, and from serious commitment to the Word of God unto evil and iniquity. You know, on the final day, all the people that teach other people, influence other people to do evil, that corrupt other people, literally are going to have the judgment of God because the Lord himself is taking note of the people that teach and that turn 
Many people to follow evil. Look at Jeremiah chapter 28. Jeremiah chapter 28. I'm going to read to you from verse 15. And we're going to read to verse 16 too. Jeremiah chapter 28. Jeremiah chapter 28. Verse 15. Then said the prophet Jeremiah unto Ananiah. The prophet. Hear now Ananiah. The Lord has not sent thee, but thou makest these people to trust in a lie. You know, as we are getting people out of lying, out of evil, out of hypocrisy, out of sin, out of hard-heartedness, out of following Satan, and we tell them to follow the Lord, turn them to righteousness. There are some people like Ananiah, and they're turning the minds of the people into a lie. And it says, therefore, thus says the Lord, Behold, I will cast thee off from the face of the earth. This year thou shalt die, because thou hast taught rebellion against the Lord. There are people like that. They teach rebellion against the word of the Lord. I did not allow the mind of the people to stay on the word of righteousness. The righteous are turning all the people to righteousness and they shall shine as stars forever and ever. But the backslide as the evil people, they are influencing others to do evil and teaching evil. Chapter 29 of Jeremiah verse 32. Jeremiah chapter 29 verse 32. Therefore thus says the Lord, behold I will punish Shemaiah, the Nehilamite, and his siege. He shall not have a man to dwell among these people. Neither shall he behold the good that I will do for my people, says the Lord. Why? Because he has taught rebellion against the Lord. I told you there are two kinds of people. There are people who are teaching other people to be sinful, to be wayward, and to be carnal, and to be worldly, and to be backsliding, and not to regard the watch of God. Those people, they will cry, they will regret in all eternity. Today, there's a chance to repent. On that final day, there will be no chance to repent. I want you to find out how many people have you led astray? How many people have you led astray? You know what you need to do? You need to go back to them and say, you know, I led you astray. I led you astray. Therefore, I'm, I'm straightening out my way now. Therefore, please come back to the Lord. Uh, can, I, can I talk to you? Can I speak the truth to you? So, you know, sometimes there are people that leave the church. And when they leave the church, they don't just leave like that by themselves. They begin to talk to the other people, especially the people that do not know they are left from their right. They are born again, they are saved, but they, they can easily be confused. And they begin to say, but look at this, but look at this. And they teach those people to rebel against the way of the Lord and to turn away from the Lord. And they actually take many people away. None that they are forming a church, they just you know, turn them away from the truth. One day, this person that has turned many people away from the truth might just realize, hey, I've done wrong. I'm repenting. And then they come back to the Lord and they come back to the church. And then they say, Pastor, I am back. I'm a child of God now. I've repented. All those bad things I said, I have returned to the Lord now. Welcome. But my brother, my sister, how about those people you influenced and they're still away in the far country? And you have led them to the false prophet. And you have led them to the places where they will not see life eternal. What are you doing? Go back to them and tell them, I've come back. I'm doing right now. I'm, I, I influence you to do evil. But now I have repented myself. And it is only when you have done your part in bringing them back to the light that you are free. That's the reason why, brothers and sisters, you know, sometimes you are wondering, somebody has, somebody has left the church for about two years, three years, five years, and then they come back to the church, and that week they come back, they want to be made a worker. They want to be made a leader. We say, no, you cannot be a leader like that. Look at all those people outside, tens and hundreds of them that you led astray, and uh, here you are, and then you are standing on the pulpit again, and preaching, and saying, thus says the Lord, I'm deeper life number one. Now, no, you cannot be. All those the people you influence to go astray you will go back to them 
That's part of rectifying your way, restoring your way unto the Lord. That's the reason why. And then those of us who are in the church, you've been here for 20 years, 30 years, and you have been there under rebuke, you are there, under chastisement, you are there, under discipline, you are there. And these people that just come by, they want to go ahead of you to become leaders and preachers. Uh, above those of you who have been staying here for 30, 20 years, no, that cannot be. They will take their place too. And of course, we are not even here for preaching or position. We're here because oh, this is the gate to heaven. I said this is the gate to heaven. I want to get to heaven, that's why we're here. Not for position, not for preaching. And so, if you've gone astray and you led other people astray, you will turn them back to righteousness. And that's how the blessings of God can come upon your life. Look at Daniel chapter 12, I'm reading from verse 3. Daniel chapter 12, verse 3. And they that be wise, I am wise. I said I am wise. They that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament. And they that turn many to righteousness. Those are, those are the wise people. The people that turn many to righteousness. That's why brothers and sisters, I'm always preaching repentance. Turn them unto righteousness. That's why we're preaching sanctification and holiness. Turn them unto righteousness. That's why we're preaching against worldliness. Come out of them and be separate says the Lord. We're turning them to righteousness. That's why we're preaching the grace of God, the faith that purifies us, that makes us new. If any man be in Christ, is a new creature. Old things are passed away. And behold, all things are what? Become new. That's what we're saying. Receive the grace of God in your life so that your life will be totally different and turn from sin unto the Savior and turn unto righteousness because only the people that turn many to righteousness. Not the people that establish churches, there are many churches. Not the people that raise up ministries, there are many ministries. Not the people that gather crowd, there are many crowds. But the people, through their preaching, through their evangelistic effort, and through the crowd they gather, they turn the people from sin unto righteousness. They are the people that will shine as stars forever and ever. I pray you will be there. That's what a preacher actually does. If you're, if you're preaching, it's not turning people to righteousness. You shouldn't be preaching. If you're not talking about repentance, about restoration, about righteousness and restitution, about uprightness, you shouldn't be preaching. The reason why we preach... And the reason why we say we're serving the Lord as pastor, as preacher, as evangelist or whatever is so that we can turn many unto righteousness. In Malachi chapter 2, Malachi chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 4. And you shall know that I have sent this commandment unto you, that my covenant might be with Levi, says the Lord of hosts. My covenant was with him of life and peace. And I gave them to him for the fear wherewith he feared me. I was not afraid, I was afraid before my name. The law of truth was in his mouth. A new creature was not found in his leaves. He walked with me in peace and equity. Tell me the the rest of verse 6 and did turn many away from iniquity that's Christianity that's righteousness that's serving the Lord not teaching people how to sin how to do evil how to be hypocritical how to be wayward how to be wicked this is ministry, turning people away from sin and turning them unto righteousness. Luke chapter 1. In Luke chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 16. Luke chapter 1 verse 16. And many of the children of Israel shall eat turn to the Lord their God. That's it. That's the reason we're ministering. That's the reason we're here. Many of the children of Israel will return to the Lord their God, verse 17, and he shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elias to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just and to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. 
Isn't that what the Lord is expecting us to do? Look at Matthew chapter 13. Turn people to righteousness. Turn people to godliness. Turn people to living upright lives by your words, by your action, by your example, by your influence, by your counseling, by your advice. You turn them unto righteousness. Those are the people that are going to be rewarded on the final day. Think about that. And live with eternity in view. In Matthew chapter 13, I'm reading from verse 43. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father who has ears to hear. Let him hear. I have ears to hear. And I'm hearing. I said I'm hearing. And I'm going to do what the Lord is teaching me to do in Jesus' name. You know, there are people, they have influence, and their influence is negative. And their influence is not only influencing people in their district, it's influencing people in their whole group. Not only that, it goes beyond their group. Not only that, it goes beyond their region. Not only that, it goes beyond their stage. In this day of GSM, of telephone, and they use the telephone to corrupt the minds of people, to turn people away from righteousness. And they say, this is how to do it, this is how we are doing it, this is how to, this is how to do it, how to do evil, how to lie, how to be corrupt, how to sin, how to turn away from sanctification and righteousness. You know, if you are doing that, there's judgment on the final day. But if you will use that same telephone and, you know, call all those people and say, you know what? I don't know what came on me that I influenced you to go the wrong way. And what came on you that all the messages you are hearing from our faithful leaders, you didn't observe, you didn't obey, and you listen to me. I'm not your preacher, I'm not your pastor. You listen to me to influence you to do evil. Now I've repented. Please repent. And if you do evil, now my hand is no more there. That's the only time the Lord will be able to justify you. But if, you know, while the Lord Jesus is building his church, you're tearing that church down by unrighteous influence. The Lord will not overlook that. That's why it's good to repent. And I pray you repent in Jesus' name. Acts of the Apostles chapter 26. Look at the reason for ministry. Acts of the Apostles chapter 26 verse 16. But rise and stand upon thy feet. For I have appeared unto thee for this purpose. To make thee a minister and a witness both of those things which thou hast seen. And of those things and the which I will appear unto thee. Delivering thee from the, from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom I now send thee. To open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light. That's ministry. That's ministry. To turn them from darkness unto light. And those are the people that are going to be rewarded on the final day. And I pray that we shall be rewarded in Jesus' name. The reward of the righteous are great, both here and hereafter, both here on earth and hereafter in heaven. We shall come forth, we shall come forth of the resurrection of life. And to them who by patient continuance and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, there will be eternal life, glory, honor, and peace to every man that worketh good. The righteous shall shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. We shall eat of the tree of life. I pray it will be given to you. We shall wear the crowns of life. We shall reign with Christ our king in his ever everlasting kingdom. We shall live forever with him. And he will make us pillars in the temple of his God. Our rewards and inheritance are great and glorious beyond description. And the servants of God who turn many to righteousness who turn many to righteousness who turn many to righteousness hey, can I speak to you for a moment you know sometimes as I move around I, I see many people you know they'll say praise the Lord pastor you're still my pastor well thank you very much for that I appreciate that I appreciate that good comment and uh, you know everything you've taught me I'm still following is that right is that right you know, some of these people that live a deeper life and, you know, I, I hope they hear me because I like them to hear. I don't like to say anything behind anybody. I like them to hear. And I'm asking them, when you are here, we taught you righteousness and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Now you are pledged and you're doing whatever you're doing. Are you following exactly what we have taught? Do you teach repentance? Do you teach being born again? 
You teach new life in Christ. You teach that if any man, or those that are coming to your new ministry now, if any man be in Christ, a new creature, and if any man be born of God, he does not commit sin. Are you teaching that? Are you teaching that they are not of the world, even as I'm not of the world? The loss of the flesh, and the loss of theirs, and the pride of life, it is not of the Father, but of the world. And he whosoever loveth the world will perish of the world, but he that loveth God abides in the word of God, he will live forever. Are you teaching that? Come out from among them, and be separate, says the Lord. Are you teaching that? And so when I come to these places, and they say, you know, uh, Pastor, thank God very much. Everything you taught me, I'm still following. This is what I've been teaching. I'm teaching the whole Bible. Are you still following that? Are we just gathering crowd and crowd and crowd? Where are we taking them to? On the final day, what will the Lord say concerning you? You taught them righteousness or you taught them iniquity? Rebellion against the word of the Lord. I pray that all of us will wake up and come back to the truth in Jesus' name. And those of us who are still remaining here, I'm, you know, saying it every time and every Monday, laying line upon line and precept upon precept. I pray that you'll not be dull of hearing. That you'll accept the truth and believe the truth and lay by the truth. And if you have any friend, any friend, that you'll try to turn you away from righteousness, you know that it's inviting the judgment of God upon his head. Because of that, you're going to be kept, you're going to say, please go your way. I don't want to be friendly with anybody to the point the fellow will lead me to hell. I, I'm turned away from unrighteousness unto righteousness. And I want to stay that way. And the influence we have on you, you want to remain with that influence. I said you want to remain with that influence. And by the way, if there's another pastor in this church that is our leader, I will submit. And I'll say the same thing I'm saying now. That you ought to listen to your pastor more than you listen to any detractor. Any bad influence. And if anybody comes to you and says anything different from what I say, what I read to you in the Bible, you ought to be wise enough to say, no, my friend, go your way. That's my father in the Lord. That's my pastor. He's showing us the way to heaven. What he says, I'm going to follow. I'm not going to follow the evil way you are leading me to. You want to take me to hell. Leave me alone. Let me follow the one that wants to take me to heaven. And if you hear the word of God we're teaching here, that heaven will get there together in Jesus' name. And this is the reason why we say that. Because our reward depends on that. Turning people unto righteousness. And I pray that as I have spoken very clearly to you, you will not shrug off the word of God. You will not reject the word of God. You are going to accept the word of God in Jesus' name. And the benefit and the reward of those who accept the word will come upon your life in Jesus' name. We are looking at First John chapter 3 from verse 1. First John chapter 3 verse 1. Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it does not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Verse 3, everybody, we're going to read verse 3 together. One, two, three, go. You see that everyone that has this hope in him purifies himself, even as he is pure. If anybody then is trying to influence you to live an impure life, a sinful life, an hypocritical life, you ought to be wise enough to say, no, I want to get to heaven. I'm not here for any man. I'm here so that my soul will be saved and remain saved. It says, and every man that has this hope in him purifies himself. Even as he is pure, the Lord will do it. I say the Lord will do it. Why don't you rise up and we're going to talk to the Lord in prayer. Every man that has this hope in him purifies himself. Even as he is pure. Talk to the Lord in prayer. Talk to the Lord in prayer. Take what you have heard, what you have learned to the Lord in prayer. Don't act like in the past. Don't harden your heart. Receive the word. Don't say you will not turn. This is for your good. Turn 
total righteousness, total holiness, total purity, total sincerity of life. Repent of the hardness of heart. Take the totality of the word of God. Don't follow deceivers, detractors. You don't want to love a tempter more than you love Christ. Your soul is at stake. There's going to be the resurrection of the just. There's going to be the resurrection of the unjust. We're not just in church for religion. Ye must be born again. You don't want to love anybody beyond above your soul. You don't want your eternal destiny to be at stake because of the wrong influence of one man, one woman teaching you contrary to the way of holiness. You want to stand solidly on this word of God. You are not making friends at the expense of your soul. Get into heaven. If anybody has gone astray, you don't want to sympathize with them and say, don't worry, I'm I'm around you, I'm supporting you, I will go to hell with you, I'll go astray with you. I know you need companion, you need a companion, you need an associate, I'll associate with you in evil. You don't want to do that. Make your stand clear. The righteous will rise to you from the dead. The sinners will rise to you from the dead. Adulterers will rise from the dead. Fornicators will rise from the dead. Unfaithful people will rise from the dead. Liars will rise from the dead. Hypocritical people will rise from the dead. But they rise unto condemnation and to judgment. But only the righteous, the wise, those that turn many to righteousness. Those are the people that will shine forever and ever as the stars of heaven in the firmament of heaven. Tell the Lord, tell the Lord, get me back to that foundation of righteousness. Fix my eyes on the goal on heaven not on religion turn me away from evil help me to be a good influence on people encouraging them to pray encouraging them to turn away from sin encouraging them to live in holiness and sanctification Help me, Lord, that I will not be teaching rebellion, teaching disobedience, teaching evil. Help me, Lord, so I will not be uprooting the pillars of holiness and righteousness, the household of faith. I want those eternal rewards. And if you have left, or you just came back, remember the people you led astray. Don't come to me and say, I want to join the workforce now. I've come back. I want to do this. I want to do that. Start by going back to the people you led astray. You taught them rebellion. You influenced them to get away from the truth. Bring them back to the truth. 
Their souls are lost because of your influence. You know what you said, you know what you did, you know how you influence people. And if you're still outside, you've had a ministry, church, whatever, wherever you are, come back to the Bible, come back to the Word. Eternal rewards, everlasting reward. It's only for the people that turn many to righteousness. Not just doing church, raising up ministry, righteousness, holiness. And if you are a pastor, you preach good, you preach great in the public, but privately, you are leading those ladies there into sin, turning them. For what you preach on the pulpit, righteousness. Turning them into sin, evil in the private. What will your judgment be? Turn many to righteousness. Resurrection of the just It will come Resurrection of the unjust It will come And the reward Of the righteous It will come And the recompense Of the unrighteous It will come Choose you This day Who you will serve and how you will serve. Come with a sincere, honest heart and say, Lord, I'll follow you till the very end of my life in small things, in big things, in great things, in little things.